Hello and welcome to Channels Book Club. I'm Olakunle Kasumu. One of the most successful movie franchises of all time is the Rambo series. The central character of this blockbuster action-packed series is John Rambo. The immensely popular John Rambo played by the great Sylvester Stallone who also starred as Rocky in the successful Rocky series is a highly skilled ex-Special Forces unit guy who had fought in Vietnam but had become a homeless drifter trying to deal with the most traumatic effects of his violent military past. The first of the Rambo movie series is titled First Blood and it was a massive hit but it was not the world's first introduction to Rambo. The First Blood movie was an adaptation of a novel titled First Blood written by David Morrell. David Morrell is a Canadian-American novelist who has written over 25 novels and whose work has been translated into 30 languages. For over three decades, Morrell has churned out bestseller after bestseller, including novels like Desperate Measures, Brotherhood of the Rose, and Blood Oath, among others. Morrell, a professor of English, is one of the most accomplished novelists of his generation. We met the very amiable David Morrell in Dallas, Texas to discuss his writing and works, especially First Blood. Enjoy this. Thank you, Mr. David Morrell. Thanks for your time. Thanks for joining us. Oh, I'm pleased to be here. I'm very excited, in fact. Um, this whole um, story, I mean, your writing story, started when you were about 17, in the 70s, and um, you were on a completely different path before, but you then decided to become a writer. Um, tell me a bit about that. Actually, like. much younger. I was much younger. I was, uh, in this country, uh, there was a television show called Route 66, which would be Highway 66 in another, uh, in another country, perhaps. And uh, it, had, it was a very famous, it was the first Trans-America Highway in the United States, and it was very famous. And, and it was called after a TV series that w involved two young men in a car that drove along through the United States. Mm -hmm. And they were young, and the, the television series, they said they were searching for themselves, they were searching for America. Uh, which would be, you know, in your country, traveling around searching for Nigeria it's a, and themselves. And I fell in love with the series and the writer of most of the scripts, whose name was very unusual, Sterling Siliphant. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sterling eventually received an Academy Award for uh, uh, adapting a mystery novel by John Ball called In the Heat of the Night that had Sidney Poitier in it and uh, Rod Steiger. And uh, I fell in love with the series and I wrote Sterling a letter asking him how I could be him. <laughs> and the generous man that he is, that he was, he's no longer with us, he sent a letter back to me, a very long letter that I have framed next to my desk all these years later. And I was 17. <laughs> uh, and in effect, he told me, you know, if you feel you, you have this in you, keep writing, keep writing, keep writing and eventually you will find other people who are interested in writing and you'll learn from them and eventually you will find somebody who has influence who can help you. It is, he said, that terribly simple and that terribly difficult. Complex. And so uh, there was some doubt as to whether I would finish high school. Do you, is high school a term familiar in Nigeria? Yes, very much. Okay, well in here we have uh, 12 grades, we have 8 grades for uh, what's called primary school or grade school and then up to grade 12 is high school and there was some doubt uh, because I was so troubled I had been in an orphanage for a time and I, my, my father had died in combat and I was very troubled but I because of Sterling finished high school and then I went to college and in fact I acquired a PhD I have a, a, a PhD in American literature and it, um, anyway, the series changed my life and I decided from when I was 17, and then the question becomes <clears throat> to learn how to write and then to learn what to write about. There are a lot of things to talk about after you decide to become a writer, but let's skip to 1972 when you wrote 
um, First Blood, which has become legendary. Um, you were primarily inspired by a CBS news report yes. um, about the Vietnam War mm -hmm. and then things happening within the United States. Um, and then they, all, they came together to create that plot and that character um, that became that has become famous right now. Yes, that's correct. Uh, run me through that experience, please. Yes, this would be the year 1968, again, which I've been around a long time. For some of your viewers, 1968 is like the Stone Age, <laughs> but, but it was a very violent year in the United States. Um, Martin Luther King Jr., one of the leaders of the American Civil Rights Movement, was assassinated. Robert Kennedy, the brother of the assassinated President John F. Kennedy, who had been assassinated, Robert Kennedy was himself assassinated. Um, in this country, uh, we have two, Democrat, two parties, political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. When the Democrats had their national convention to nominate someone to run for president in Chicago, there were riots outside the convention, and these riots actually spilled into the convention. Um, and they, they were between war protesters and the police, who, according to history, overreacted, uh, so that a government commission decided that it had, in effect, been a police riot. And all of this contributed to a national unrest which caused not 10 or 50 or 100 riots, but several hundred riots in the United States that left some inner cities, particularly, and these names might not mean you know, anything to your audience, but major cities like Gary, Indiana, Detroit, Michigan, Los Angeles, California, in their core, some of them never recovered to this day. So it was a big year. It was, I thought, because I was raised in Canada mm. in southern Ontario, so I was an immigrant to the United States going to graduate school at uh, Pennsylvania State University. And I was, I didn't know what was going on. And I thought, I truly thought there was a, a possibility that with all of these clashes and, and assassinations that there might be a civil war. And it was out of that that I thought I would write the novel First Blood, which originated the character of Rambo, um, that the novel would mirror what I saw happening in the country. So I would pick a returned Vietnam veteran who was looking around to see what he had been fighting for the United States. And then I would have a police officer who represented in this country, we call it the establishment, the power and authority, uh, and uh, that he would represent that. And they would, the novel would have a viewpoint from the police officer, and then it would switch to Rambo, and then it would switch to the police officer and go back to Rambo, because I didn't want to take sides. I wanted it to be able so that they were, as it were, debating back and forth. Uh, and that it would be basically how they were not able to understand one another. That was the theme. That as it were, each was trapped in that character's viewpoint. So the, the novel um, was published in 1972. It took me three years to write it. And I was trying to find a way to write action that was different and one that would be political as it were, but without any politics in it that readers would know what I was talking about without a lot of speeches about it. Uh, and I think the novel to this day has never been out of print in English. 47 years it has remained in print. So it speaks to people. And then um, you can ask me about you know, what happened next, but then of course I sold the film to the movies. I'm really keen on getting to um, understand or have a feel of you know, what runs through your mind. Um, you wrote a story, you put it in a book, got published, and it has grown into what it is today, uh, a movie, a successful movie franchise, 
Um, we could go on and on and on what Rambo has grown to become today. How does it feel being in that position with the benefit of hindsight, looking back you know, at when you wrote that book and what it has become today? Well, it was the first novel, so you immediately have the insecurity of a beginning novelist trying to figure out how to write a novel, which is not easy. Um, and then on, on top of that, I was trying, because by then I was in university, you know, by then I was studying serious literature. And while I don't pretend that First Blood is you know, something that the Nobel Prize people would give me an award for, I did have ambitions to write a book that maybe could make a difference. Uh, and what the difference I wanted to make was in how I was writing the action. Uh, at that time, uh, action books would be filled with ordinary expressions such as a gunshot rang out or gun smoke filled the air. Um, in this country, we call it, because it comes out of a tradition of what they call pulp fiction, so we would call it a pulp style, and it just sort of signifies what it sounds like. It's not very good. Uh, and, and I was trying, as it were, to raise things. And my, my goal was to write an action film, a novel, that didn't feel like what we would call a genre novel or what we would call the way novels had been written before. Uh, and so it took me three years, and often I had doubts, and often I stopped. But the story kept talking to me, so I, I pushed forward. And my agent at the time, because the action in it was so different, was written in so realistic a fashion, my agent wasn't sure that we would find a publisher. Uh, and in fact, when he submitted it, it sold to a publisher within six weeks. But I was a first novelist. It was very well received. It, it, it was reviewed, which is rare for a first novel. It was re reviewed a lot, a, a lot of important places, such as the New York Times, for example. Um, and it did very well. I was, I was very happy. If nothing else had happened, I would have been excited. But I had sold the movie rights to, to a Columbia Pictures, who sold it to somebody else, who sold it to somebody else. And eventually, in 1982, the film of First Blood as we know it, with Sylvester Stallone, made by a, com a new company called Carol Co. Pictures. Um, eventually, it was released. So now we had a second as it were, generation. We had the book in 72, we had the movie in 82, and the movie used the plot of First Blood with some significant changes, but it was recognizable. Uh, Stephen King is a, is a friend, and Stephen uh, had taught First Blood when he taught creative writing at the University of Maine. He knew the novel well. And he said to me, he thought I was treated about as well as Hollywood could treat a writer because he recognized the story, which isn't always the case in a movie. Um, so um, it uh, had a new life, and it had changes from the novel, but it was sort of the novel. What happened is they reinterpreted the character. My character was angry about what had happened to him in war and what he'd learned about himself, what he'd re been required to do to survive. Uh, and the movie, 10 years later, after the end of Vietnam, which was not successful for the United States, uh, by 1982, there was a move in the United States to sort of reinterpret those years so that we could have won the war if only politicians hadn't interfered mm -hmm. and let the military do what it could. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But what they, what, to, to interpret the character to meet that kind of new attitude, the, the film made the character not angry about what he had experienced, but instead it made him a victim. Did you approach Columbia? Um, to sell the rights to your movie, or it was the other way around? The way it, it, it works in the United States for books is that authors have what are called agents. 
So basically, these are salespeople who know publishers, they know movie people, they have the connections to be able to, that I would not have. And plus, I wouldn't want to try to sell something of mine because I'm so flattered that somebody would want something I'd written that I might give it away. So a, 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 another person who, is, who gets 10% in those days and now 15% of what the amount of money is, they have an interest in as much money as possible and they, you know, they don't have that personal, I spent so many years writing the book connection. So my agent had contacts on the, uh, as we say here, the West Coast or Hollywood. And uh, so he found people who associated with Columbia Pictures who felt that it would be a good match for, at that time, a writer-director named Richard Brooks. Uh, uh, he isn't as well known today as he was then, but he was an Academy Award winner for a movie such as Elmer Gantry. Um, and um, so, you know, then the, the development process, as they call it, occurred. Uh, but I, I, it all required an agent to do that for me. When you wrote First Blood, in 1972, did you think, did you imagine that it will grow to become what it has grown to be over the years, a hugely successful brand and franchise and uh, book? Um, first of all, to put it in a historical context, in the 20th century, uh, and I'm mostly speaking about English now, in the English language, there were five characters that came out of novels, that became movies, and that, be, that were known worldwide. Some, one of them is perhaps not known worldwide at the moment and will be very sensitive to Africans because the, the one is Sherlock Holmes, but the next one is Tarzan, ah. you know, so that would be very sensitive to you all. Um, but nonetheless, an internationally recognized character. And then James Bond, and then Rambo, and then Harry Potter. Mm. So we have this, these five characters that sort of spread. And now I could not have predicted this. I was just trying to write as true a novel, as honest a novel, as interesting and dramatic a novel as I could with all these implications that I mentioned earlier um, without being political, but having a political context. And then things began to happen, and all these reviews that were so wonderful, and then the movies. And I remember talking to Sylvester Stallone about this, and I, I said to him, it's very, very strange, isn't it, that Rambo is not only in the movies everywhere, and to the books to some degree, but movies are obviously more widespread and popular, but also in everyday language, is the name Rambo in, you, in English in your country? You know, we'll say, oh, you're being oh, a yeah, Rambo. Of <laughs> I mean, it's everywhere. And I'll, I am watching, and I said this to, I call him Sly. Uh, that's his nickname, Sylvester Sly. And, and I, I said to him, you know, it's so weird to be watching a TV show or a movie where somebody, like there's, there are books in which there are dogs named Rambo, or you know, somebody says, hey, what are you doing Rambo? Or you know, in other films they say, you're trying to be Rambo now, aren't you? And, or we see it, I, I mean, it's rare per day even that I don't hear that name. Rambo. And in a minute I gotta tell you where the name came from, it, that we don't hear the name uh, everywhere. So I said to him, isn't this strange, you know, that this phenomenon happened and who could have predicted? And he agreed with me that we'd be in a conversation or watching a movie or seeing something on TV or in a book where the name would occur and for a moment we are part of the audience saying, oh yeah, there's that Rambo. <laughs> and then we say, wait a minute, we created this. <laughs> we made this happen. Uh, but um, I'm going to put. I'm going to ask a question that you didn't ask, but I think people would be interested about the name. Uh, From a dog or something? No, no. It's better than that. <laughs> it's okay, better than okay, that. Tell me about that. I I was a poor graduate student, married with a, a a young young daughter, like two years old, and we didn't have much money. We had a little, and my wife was out somewhere, and she found a place along the road that was selling apples. Hmm. And she brought the apples home, and I remember, I remember the day vividly. And we had, we were in a 
living room, bedroom, apartment. And there was a, a, a bathroom and then the kitchen was sort of off the living. It was just a counter that we could cook on. So, and I was in the bedroom. We, we've all, the three of us slept in the bedroom and there was a little desk there and I'm typing away. And she said, oh, I found these apples. They taste pretty good. Bite on this apple. And I, yeah, 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 I'm writing, leave me alone. And because I knew I needed the name of force, but I couldn't. And I, when I typed, I left a blank for the name. I didn't have the name yet. I go, and then blank, da, da, and then I'd write the rest of the sentence. So, so she kept saying, bite the apple, bite the apple. Now, you know, this is kind of mythic, <laughs> bite into this apple. So I said, all right, and I bit into the apple. It tasted pretty good. And in this country, I don't know what it's like in Nigeria, we have an automatic response, which is something tastes good. Hey, that's pretty good. What's it called? <laughs> and she said, it's a Rambo apple. Whoa. And I said, what? I, she said, a Rambo apple. I said, spell it. So she said, R-A-M-B-O. And I had the name. Now, Rambo apples are popular in Pennsylvania. It's a real apple, and it comes from Scandinavia. Uh, and Rambo is a name in Scandinavian, which means mountain dweller. Uh, so, I mean, there's a kind of a history here, but, you know, people seem to enjoy the fact that the name Rambo comes from an apple. What would you say to a young man or a young woman who wants to be a writer? What, what advice would you give to such a person? I, can, I have two things that I follow, two rules, and that I tell other writers. And there's there no guarantee that they will get you a career and that you know you will be able to earn a living or even you know be bestseller which is very rare these days the first is that we have to be true to ourselves that we what the way i put it is be a first rate version of yourself and not a second rate version of someone else and this applies to writing to everything else we, that, that's why i felt compelled to speak about the fifth film we must be true to ourselves and re writers who have a career usually are individual. They are unique and distinctive. And people who read them go because they get something from that writer that they don't get from any of these others. And the second rule is um, that you don't want to chase, I'm, I'm being colloquial in America, you don't want to chase the market. You know, you don't want to follow trends. Uh, you don't want to imitate other people. Um, the, the way I put it is you don't want to chase the market because you'll always see its backside. You'll always see its back end, you know. And, and if you follow these, at least you have a good chance. Uh, Hemingway said, an, a writer who wrote about Africa, and I have no idea how his works about Africa, you know, are received in Africa, um, but, in fact, one of his books was called Green Hills of Africa, about big game hunting, and, you know, I, I don't know what to make of that. But, but Hemingway said the secret to a career, there were three of them, there was talent, there was determination, and there was luck. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how these mix together, you don't know. I, have, I know many writers who have the determination and the, and the skill never had the luck. And other people had the luck, and sold things that maybe they didn't have the, the skill so much, but, but they had the luck. So, but those, those rules, I think, would fit for everybody. Thank you very much, Mr. Morell. It's been a pleasure having this conversation with you. Thanks for your time. Thank you for well, it time. was my pleasure, it's truly. I hope you enjoyed that. As always, we'll be delighted to get your feedback through any of our social media platforms displayed on your screen. I'm Olakunle Kasumo. Remember, one great book can change your life. Bye-bye.